Oh, hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you are listening to The Long Game Podcast. In this conversation, I'm talking to Joel Kletke. Joel is the founder of Case Study Buddy, which helps mid-market to enterprise B2B brands turn every customer success story into a campaign's worth written in video assets by handling all of the heavy lifting it takes to get case studies done. Previously, he worked as a conversion copywriter and CRO consultant. In this conversation, we cover the ins and outs of a great case study, including the processes that need to be in place in a company, as well as the team needed and the best structure and how to best leverage case studies for success. We also cover the mindset shifts required to go from solo consultant or individual contributor into a business leader and the stages that one goes through in that process. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Joel Kletke. If you're cool with jumping in now, I would like to, I I actually had a very serendipitous opportunity this morning. I met up with Liana Patch and uh, we talked about you. She uh, she brought you up. So I got to ask her, what should I ask Joel? And um, (laughs) (laughs) she actually had a a recommendation right off the top of her head, which was uh, around how your mindset and uh, I guess like self uh, reflection and self management has shifted. Um, cause she says she has seen you go through various stages of, of being, you know, a top tier freelancer and consultant to a business owner, to a stressed out business owner, to yeah. trying to transform, which you mentioned before, um, about like getting back into, you know, healthy, <laughs> healthy life habits. So I don't know if that's a broad question, but generally how has your mindset shifted through these various stages? Yeah. I mean, it's. Shifted a lot. I think when you first start out, especially when you first go out on your own, um, you know, I I think a lot of people go into business for themselves because there is this level of confidence. There's this level of wanting to be the best and wanting to do your best work and wanting to, you know, work with the big companies and, and have the big success and hit that six figures and all that. And so it's like, in the early going before I was married was when I went out on my own in 2013. And my mindset there was definitely felt like I had a lot to prove, um, wanted to see what I was more capable of. And then I really fixated on the money. Um, admit, you know, I think a lot of people are, it's how much can I make and how fast can I make it and how am I measuring up? And uh, and so I think, you know, there, there are things about that that were good. There are things about that that benefited me, you know, that competitive spirit and that wanting to do great work. And I think the underlying perfectionism you know, that I brought to that, there were some net positives because it allowed me to make good strides, allowed me to make a good income, it allowed me to build a good network. But there's a lot of detriment to that too. I think, you know, some people are fantastic at asking for help or being vulnerable. I'm not one of those people, you know, and even though you're part of these great communities, for me at least, you know, a big part of it is wanting to be seen a certain way or wanting to be seen as like an authority or or a leader. And that's me being brutally honest. I think a lot of people feel this way. They just don't say it out loud to themselves, but it influenced a lot of how I spent my time. And and I think any stress generated in the early goings there, for me at least, it wasn't, well, am I getting enough clients or thing like that? It was how fast am I moving and how you know how much am I making and all of that and so not being able to ask for help or not not being willing to be vulnerable or or not being able to kind of slow down and be objective and and measure things in a broader sense than just what's the money like I think that left some wounds that that later me got to deal with um you know later in in copywriting I started to hit that that wall when I was out on my own um you know I'd launch case study by on the side as, as a scalable thing um, and you know, that was kind of in the background. The whole reason for launching that was to find out, like, can I build a team? Can I be a business owner or manager? You know, like I wanted to learn those types of things. So there's some seismic events, you know, shifts for me. Like one was shifting my focus to case study, buddy. one was getting married, another was having kids, all that stuff is gonna add up. And when you're out on your own by yourself, freelance, nobody cares if you work till nine o'clock at night. It's, it's just you and you make decisions based on where your mindset's at. Um, when you're married, that stops being okay. <laughs> um, you know, there's other new area of your life to be pouring into. Uh, and then when you've got kids, 
it's not just not okay. It's impossible. <laughs> um, if you uh, honestly, if you love your kids and that might be controversial, but like they're a priority for me. So a huge amount of my mindset shift in the middle was going from how much can I make, how quickly, and how can I look like an authority and how can I get on stage? And, you know, I had felt like I had a lot to prove to finally, I think, accepting I can't do it all. I do need help. It doesn't really matter how much I make if I'm unhealthy or if I'm not spending time with my family. And that's a hard wall to hit, um, you know, around kind of the end of my consulting work is when I, for the first time, got an executive coach and started getting someone to help me be accountable and, and look at the world in a different way. Um, it's when I started running and trying to make you know, time for health and fitness in a broader sense. You start to feel your own vulnerability a bit. Um, but then as a company grows, there's a huge mind shift, uh, mindset shift there too, and new kinds of stressors. The things that stress me out now are different. When you've got people relying on you, it's how can I build this for them or how can I keep this going? How can I position a way that keeps us afloat? There's a lot of tension and friction and stress that comes with challenging parts of who you've been uh, when you're a lone wolf. And you do things your way all the time, adapting to I have a team to teach and nurture and lead. I haven't always been the best at that. And then working in a team is a completely different experience than working on your own, too. Um, you know, again, you you need different ways of communicating, you need different ways of being collaborative, you need different ways of making yourself available and visible to, to those people. So there's been a lot of changes, a lot of things that I've gone through. And I, I think to cap it off, like there will always be things that will stress you out. There will always be more money to be made. There will always be bigger or more or different clients to work with, but working to define like what you actually want from life and what serves you and what serves people around you, I think takes some level of experience and maturity that for me just took a, a longer time to figure out. And I continue to figure out and fall on my face a bit with. Do you feel like, uh, Adding constraints, uh, you know, family as well as employees has forced the idea of being more effective in a way, because I feel like you've still got ambition. You still want to grow your company. You still want to, you know, accomplish. So it doesn't seem like maybe like that has, I don't know if that's tamped down, but like, do you, I, I've seen, you know, people go through this before and it's like, they have few fewer hours, but they have more people dependent on them. So it's like, they're forced to really, really scrutinize how they're spending those hours. And sometimes yeah. they end up packing more into those hours. Yeah. See, that's the thing. Everybody, everybody's going to spin it in the positive, right? And they're going to say like, yeah, it really forced me to focus. No one's going to come out and say like, yeah, it forced me to focus. And also I still overworked, right? And I think, yeah, it does. You know, I, I have had to get more ruthless about my time and, and what I get done in it. But I think I want to be honest about the fact that it creates, again, new tension. And if you don't have a system for allocating your time, or if you don't have a, a means of delegating things, right? You, you have to get in those situations. It's not just, well, constraints are there. You can have constraints and still blow past those constraints or cram too much within those constraints. I think there's a brutally honest conversation you have to have with yourself ongoing, which is where am I doing too much? What can I continue to let go of? Um, and that, it's not instantaneous. It's not like, oh, kids are born. I'm like, okay, I can suddenly focus like a superhero. It's a lot of tough learning, right? And and for me, that's certainly been the case. Again, even now, as as case study would goes through changes, and you know, I'm I'm pulled in more directions now that I have more people. I'm still pulled into, well, oh, there's a an accounting issue, or oh, there's a sales issue, or whatever. Even though you have, and sometimes leaders in those seats or people you've delegated to, and so you. You know, yes, it has forced me to focus and do more in less time, but it's also got me having new conversations with myself on an ongoing basis of where am I still doing too much? Where do I still need to let go? Where do I need to be more ruthless with that time? I think it does people a disservice to imagine that like, oh, a baby shows up and you're, you're miraculously cured of your overwork. It's certainly not been my experience. Yeah. Yeah, I always say uh, getting anything done requires the Zen-like ability to let small fires burn because it's like they 
but those little things, the, the, the accounting issues, et cetera, like those are all going to happen. And it's really, it's deciding like the, those problems are still there. There's still problems, but like, what can you let sit in the back of your mind without it preventing you from doing the work in front of you and sort of ignore or drop or let go of some of those things in order to actually get the stuff in front of you done? Yeah. I mean, to key into that too, I think that was a huge change that had to happen for me. Like when you're solo, the goal is no fires ever mm-hmm. because if there's a fire, you set it. Um, you know, and, and so I, I would be super, you know, all over everything to make sure nothing went wrong ever at any point. Um, the minute you start working with people and the more people there are to work with, yeah, that's a good way of putting it is letting small fires burn because there will always be something going on, something to divert your attention to some issue to address or obstacle to overcome. and prioritizing that or being okay with no i can't address this right away like i used to respond to every email within the hour it came in yep all over it it goes and i've had to learn and unlearn i guess that i've had to to be okay with that no longer being possible i can't respond to every message i can't respond to every email it's not that you don't want to be available or what have you but yeah, you do have to get to a place of like accepting not only like you cannot do it all all the time, but shit's going to go wrong. Um, you know, like that's that's been a continual lesson and something I think I've gotten much better at too is like when it was just me, a mistake was devastating. If something went wrong that could have been prevented, again, because it's all on you, you know, it's all oh, this, you know, I'd take it, I'd take it hard. You know, it's like, oh, this. This never should have happened. Businesses should run perfectly kind of mentality I had. And now that I've got a team, I've got great people. I love, I love our people. Even the best people will make mistakes. It's going to happen. The, the best laid plans, the best laid processes, it doesn't matter. Stuff will go sideways. There, things will come up in accounts. And, you know, my expectation proves like no issues in accounts ever. There's, you know, there's nothing, you know, that that I can't control for and, and eliminate out of the process. And the reality is that's just not true. Stuff is going to happen and learning. Okay. To, to be okay with small failures. Um, you know, if it doesn't break you, you know, it, it should either make you stronger, at least you'll learn from it or, or your team will learn from it. And to cap that thought off, like your team needs to learn how to make mistakes and how to recover from them and how to deal with them. And, you know, you need to learn how to take your claws out and let them do that. And that's scary going from, from solo to, to business owner, but it's been a, a really important part of that journey. Going from solo to business owners is fascinating because you are not only like solo, but I feel like copywriting is such a craft. You know, you've, you've got like your fingerprints are all over the work, right? It's a high control area. So what has the biggest challenge been or maybe transformation you've had to make uh, making that transition? Yeah, I mean, it's there's been different biggest challenges over time. In the early goings, it was getting out of the work itself, right? Too many people block their own shots because they can't let what's created not be theirs. And I literally had to go on vacation and just let things go out without me looking at them and let the feedback come in without me intervening to get past that point. Like it was me going away and my team, you know, seeing that the house didn't cave in that allowed me to go, all right, yeah, I might have worded it differently, but it doesn't really matter. You know, the the client was happy or it got approved. And and so that was one of the big things very early on was you know, I, I can't be the one to do all of the things and I need to let some, you know, I can set a standard, I can set a target. I can't control every deliverable that that ever goes out of this place. And early on, that's tough. I think over time, you know, kind of what I just mentioned, like learning to let people make and learn from mistakes. It's an, an integral part. You know, again, like I'm wired up to want to just see an issue, solve the issue, move on. But if I solve every problem for my team that does a disservice to them. Again, I, they need to learn how to cultivate a, a curious mindset and evaluate a situation and make a call. Um, and, and you hope that that builds into them being confident and then introducing things that you wouldn't have thought of or building things that you are like, wow, I, I never would have considered doing it that way. And, and that's really awesome. Um, I think there's also 
uh, a bit of like a grieving process that comes with the further away you get from the craft itself. You know, it's ironic, a big part of my shifting to focus on case study value was because I was just done with the hands-on work. I was getting to a point of frustration and anger and, and disappointment with the work I was doing, even though the work I was doing was great. I just found myself in this bad cycle of like overanalyzing what I was doing and wanting to take a step back from the craft. So I did. Worked on case study buddy instead. And now that I'm at a distance, it's the grass is always greener. You kind of miss it. Like, oh, I really wish I was yeah. back in the weeds again, doing, you know, doing some of this stuff, right? Like it's a big lie that like shifting out of that stuff will forever make you happy. You're shifting into something else will make you sad. Like there's there's things you appreciate about each. So yeah, i the the biggest part for me in in embracing like being a business owner though has just been learning to let go not only of the work but eventually of the process and eventually of you know you you not just let go but let go and trust like you have to learn how to hire people equip them and then get out of their way and that that is easier said than done that's a hundred percent that's that's what i felt as well we we keep each other accountable at omniscient and we've been saying lately it's like we want to delegate to the point where it's uncomfortable uh it, it should feel a little scary the level at which we're letting go um also on the point of grass is greener i don't think i i I think every smart vp i've talked to has always harbored a secret desire to get back into the the weeds like they've all said that (laughs) yeah i mean you you spend years at least i spent years you know cultivating that skill set and it's kind of like once you've seen you know like in in the movie the matrix kind of once you've seen the code like can't unsee it right and for me in deliverables now or in conversion stuff for example i can't i can't not throw open a landing page and go, oh that, 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 that. you know yeah, like, yeah. the things like this but i do you know i can't see that stuff go by and not uh you know not want to say something i think the other you know challenge in business but what, what this conversation is reminding me too is like it's really hard for someone who is ambitious and for me in particular, like I'm more of, I hate the word visionary, but like I'm, and I also hate the word, um, the idea of an ideas guy, but like, that's, that's kind of the stuff that lights me up in business is coming up with the concept and framing out the early parts of it and giving it a push and rolling new things in. And I think a hard lesson for me also has been staying in, in my lane because you see opportunity everywhere. Like we could do this, we could roll that in, we could build this out. It wouldn't be that hard. And like, Anytime you you say like how hard could it be, you're about to find out. That's that's been my experience. And so like with all this stuff, for example, happening right now in like AI and Chat GPT, there's all kinds of like, oh, look, look, I can start mm-hmm. this, I can do that, and like committing and and sticking to you know your team and your venture and knowing where to edge out and expand and and where to just say no. Now is either now is not the time or that's just not something something we can do it's tough to shut that part off too because it's just you you can be agile you can move to anything as quick as you want but impacting you know careful change management in a company you know i've I've been bitten by that so the process there's things we rolled out too quickly i'm like ooh. in retrospect i you know it was a lot harder than 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 i expected you know and and i've had to learn from that too You, you need to have kind of a different level of consideration preparation collaboration when you're sounds obvious when you're in a team but it'll bite you real hard you know you'll you'll learn that lesson real fast if you try to go too quickly in that direction not everybody is growing in yeah that shiny object syndrome is tough um because like you said it is kind of like the fire that lights the business in the first place but i think most people that I've seen who have reached a modicum of success end up falling prey to it a couple of times. And I think if they're fully honest with themselves, like they could have gotten more value and it would have been more rewarding to just keep going on the path that was working. And that's something that I tell myself a lot is like, it's, it's almost always better to double down and keep the focus instead of like spraying out in multiple directions and, and diluting that focus. Focus is a hard commodity to, to keep. And, uh, I think in most cases, what has been working is what you want to focus your attention on. And that's very difficult. Yeah. Well, and two, even more so because so much of the chatter in, you know, whether it's venture capital land or founder land or business owner land, like so many people get praised for having like their hands in a million pots. 
you know, they're like, oh, he's doing this and this and this and passive income and 20 income streams. And like so many people sell themselves on that. And it becomes this like almost default mentality that, oh, I should be doing lots of different things. And I should have lots of different irons in the fire. And and I should be able to run three businesses concurrently and do it without breaking a sweat. And that's not to say there's anything bad about the people who have found success doing that. But what I continue to learn about the people who have done that successfully is they're either like ruthlessly efficient with their time. Like Joanna Weeb's a good example of this in that like she has had multiple ventures at once, but she is just, I love her in, you know, to my core, but she, she's works extremely hard and a lot. And you have to be willing to commit to like that insane degree of time and energy and focus, or, you know, you have to be brutally honest about what you want your role in these things to be. Like usually the people that I see who are doing that successfully, it's not their first rodeo. They didn't do it out of the gate. They did spend a lot of time on one thing, picking up a bunch of lessons about like where and how they like to fit. And then they brought those systems with them to these other things. Um, but they're pretty brutally honest with themselves about like where their role will start and stop. They're okay being like, I'm going to spin up the idea. I'm going to give it a nudge. And then I move into advisory and, and I'm off. And again, that's so much easier said than done, especially, you know, like case sideways, my first, well, first successful multi-person, you know, venture, right? I'm I'm learning the things that might allow me to do stuff like that later. But if I beat myself up too much because I'm not running a, a course and a company and another company and 10 other things, like I'll, I'll never get anywhere. That focus is, you know, it's not sexy uh, in, in the Twitterverse and on social, but it's pretty critical in practicality of found. It's also, I think there's like a correlation thing. You, you hear this phrase all the time about like mil- the average millionaire has like seven streams of income and it's like now now they do, but like to get to that first million, they did one thing really well and like made their money on that. And I think about that with our agency. It's like, what if we spun off like a, a side agency that just did digital PR, just did AI content or editing or something like that, or like built out a course business? And like, sure, we could have a small success with each of those. But what if instead we actually built this thing to $10 million and then did the next thing and then, and then layered them on? Over time, and I think that's probably the more common case. It's just now you look and do this, um, you know, se- cross sectional analysis of qu- like successful people, and you're like, oh, they have all these different streams, and it's like, yeah, but they didn't start with all those streams. Yeah, yeah, and again, like, what's their actual role in all of those things? Like, they're not doing the production work, you know. They're they're not, you know, they they've built teams, like they've become excellent at team building, delegation systems, like. And yeah, normally there's been one sort of big thing where they learned a lot of those lessons, they got that experience, and then they carry aspects of it of it with them. But yeah, I mean that's that's another mindset, you know, shift that you know to to come to agreement with yourself on am I doing enough? Yes, <laughs> that's it can be tough. It, it can be tough. You know, you feel like, well, I'm limiting myself, or other people are passing me by, or look at her with all her ventures and it's like no you it's not about their journey it's about your own you know like maybe you'll get there but for now the, the fastest path to getting to multiple successful businesses is maybe maybe get one first so speaking of focus i mean case studies it's a very specific focus area within content within copywriting why did you choose case studies yeah case studies customer stories um i mean the backstory is you know I've been doing the conversion consulting for a company and then someone who sat on their board said, Hey, I advise this little company called Pingboard and they need a case studies. Oh, That's something you do. And a Pingboard. And uh, in Austin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh I said, Oh, for you, for you, I do. You know, I was just one of those people who was like, Yeah, I'm just well connected and you want to impress them. So I I did that first case study. And in the course of doing that, there's a, a number of things that just stood out to me as like a recipe for for possibly great business. I think first I realized doing the hands-on work, like, oh, there's a ton of moving parts to this. It's actually much harder than I, or I think most people expect. And then the second thing is it's a premium asset like because there's many moving parts and, and multiple stakeholders by default, you can charge a premium for this. Okay. And then 
kind of realized that well, there's there's it's not just many moving parts, the different specialized kind of parts like interviewing and writing, and then the design piece, someone's got to do that. And so okay, well, that starts to sound like something a team could be built around. But then for all of that stuff, there's still a repeatable process. And so like, okay, well, if I do these same steps every time, you know, you can kind of arrive at, you know, it's something you could build a process around. And then finally, you know, in, in doing all that and kind of realizing all that, I, I went online and kind of looked at, well, who specializes in this? Like, who can I learn from? Who can I, you know, who who's the authority? And it was a wasteland. There's like Casey Hibbard and like, she's the OG. There are companies that, you know, like weren't on my radar at the time because they didn't rank well and didn't have a lot of visibility. But there's there's nobody, you know, it's it like, well, it's always an add-on service or something in addition or the odd freelancer here or there. But nobody had really seemingly built a team that just like did this and did it really well. So, okay, well, it's massively blue ocean. Every B2B business needs this. Something I can build a process around. It's complex enough to be something I can charge a premium for. So. Yeah, I'll, you know, why not? It, it seems like something that is needed. And so that was kind of the impetus for, for starting it. And so in the early going, it was just kind of me quietly doing case studies for friends or connections and trying to learn more about like what could go wrong. And then pretty early on, I brought in Jen, who is my partner now in the business, because she had more of like the biz dev and, you know, formal account management and project management experience. And, you know, I, I, at the time, didn't envision this being my full-time gig. So I thought, well, having some more people in the mix would be good. And then brought Steven over, who worked with me on conversion projects. And he started writing. And then we hired Lindsay originally as a writer. And then she was just so much better at interviewing. So good letter specialized there. And so it kind of grew you know, organically out of that. But yeah, it's just a confluence of factors where it's like, yeah, there's there's a really viable underserved niche here. And I think I think I could fill it. When was the point that you lifted your head up and and just said like, holy shit, this is a business as opposed to something that was just like something you were doing on the side or, or I don't know. When was that moment of realization for you? Um, I think, you know, it like it had quietly hummed along um, on the side, successfully small scale, you know, like our first year, it was so small. There was hardly any focus. I think we did like $17,000. I'm like, oh, this is kind of a cool niche side gig. I think it was when a major social network rolled through our inbox as like a potential lead that I was like, oh, okay. Like they're coming to us. We're not doing any marketing and, and they're getting referred to, to us. And not only that, we're closing them. Um, that's was like, this thing's got legs. Like this, the potential is really here we are actually a bona fide business. We really just need to steer the ship, right? Before that, it was regarded as like a side project. But I think that was the moment where I went, okay, this is too big to ignore. Um, I think after that point, you know, I get a new kind of realization, like every so often I put my head up and realize like, oh, there are like 12 people who rely on <laughs> rely on this company for their full-time income. Like, yeah, we're a grown ass business now. Um, but yeah, I think that was the moment when you was like, yeah, this, this is something, um, that was, that, that's where it became impossible to. Ignore. That makes sense for me. Like, yeah, having employees was one of those things where I was like, I, I have to be a grown up now. Like if, if I mess up for me, it's like one thing and like, that's disappointing, but like you kind of bear this burden of responsibility, or at least it's a perceived burden of responsibility where um, you don't want to let everybody else down, you know? And, and in fact, you want it to be a great launching pad for people's careers. And you want it to be like this, this growth experience. And I think that was when I looked up and I'm like, Oh, wow, this is real. Let's, do, let's do this. You know? And I, I kind of felt some pressure to level up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, continues for me right i mean it's it's difficult when you've been remote from day one and, and kind of you go from contractors to staff um you know we're kind of a hybrid now we have both but that adjustment to like oh we've got full-time people it necessitates a whole different way of thinking about some things and it puts more priority on things like well what is our culture and how are we fostering that and that's something that jen my partner is, is really good about thinking about or um well, what is our 
financial forecast and what are we doing about it? And, you know, again, a lot of stuff that like just doesn't necessarily come naturally to me. Like I'm, I'm not a guy who's like in spreadsheets and modeling stuff out for the future. Cause I never had to be when you're freelance. It's just like invoice out, money comes in, you know, leads in the pipeline. I'm good. Uh, very different you know, when you're a business and some hard, hard learning and new things to wrap your head around and new places to ask for help in, in that too, right? Like finding a way to achieve what you want to achieve and build out what you want to build out and knowing full well, like I cannot be the person to do this because it's just not how I'm wired up. For me, it was also um, this invocation of, of uh, repeatable activities, including customer acquisition, employee onboarding and the services we deliver. Because I think when we were just starting our thing out, it was also on the side as we all worked at HubSpot. And initially it was just the founders and we'd work with a couple of contractors and we could kind of like, you know, patch together different different tactics and ways we would do things. But eventually, like you need to have some homogenized process for the the sanity of everybody involved, as well as like the service delivery. And I think that forcing function um, made the business feel much more it's 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 not self-sustaining like if all of us jumped out like it wouldn't be a business anymore but like it it, it became more of its own beast as opposed to us just like scrambling to kind of figure things out on an ad hoc basis um and you need more repeatable lead flow you need you need to find ways to consistently generate customers to consistently reduce churn and all of that stuff as well and you look much more into i think systems as opposed to like oh how can i like service this one client now because i have them yeah yeah i mean i was fortunate in that you know i i really when i first launched case study buddy looked at it we've evolved the way from this raw definition but i looked at it as a productized service like to me from the beginning with case study buddy the process was the business and so from mm -hmm. the outset there was a lot of like homing in on what is you know how do we do these stories what are the templates we write to you know what are the steps we go through um but the process at the beginning as you'd expect it was pretty rinky dink compared to like what it is now and as more job functions and people and you know, things get added or evolve, you continue to build it out. So I think that's one thing that like, because conversion, like conversion projects for me were so process centric too. It's how I won business when I was on that side was being able to come into a company and say like, this is how, I'm, how we're going to get this done. This is how we're going to walk through it. I kind of had that already as a mentality of like, yeah, the, the process really matters. So I was fortunate to, you know, with case study, and because we launched so you know, slowly and grew so slowly in the beginning on purpose, right? Because it was a side project, we had more breathing room to kind of like dial that in before it was like, oh, we're drowning. And now how do we figure that out? And then later for us came the drowning part where it's like, eventually we reached this critical point of scale where it's like, okay, well, we have processes, but they worked when we were a $200,000 company hmm. and they don't work at all now you know like the one of the bumpiest transitions was going from no ops manager to now we have an amazing ops manager to now uh oh the volume of work has outgrown what one operations manager can feasibly handle um and and that you know that was almost harder in the early goings you know getting things in place was pretty simple it's later you really come to understand what people mean when they say building the plane while you're flying it, because all of a sudden you can become a victim to your own success if you're not careful. You know, we I'm I'm incredibly impressed with my team because we literally, in some cases, changed the tires while the car was driving. Like we went entirely from like a good Trello-based kind of back end, which worked very well when one ops manager was the person to migrating out of that into now close and click up and automations between them. And that all happened while project volume was just going do 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 up and up and up. You know, um, we, we rolled out the AM function while project managers were still shouldering it and, and then we're able to split it off and like navigating that change, um, trying and, and difficult and thankfully we've got again an incredible team that's been really patient and collaborative and 
we've all learned to delegate or draw boundary lines. So you know, I think that was a, a really difficult transition for us going from, okay, we've got a process, but now we need a different one. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just zero to one. It's, well, now how do we go from one to, one to 10? Why do you think you mentioned before um, knowing you were kind of like a, a business when a, a large company, a large social media company came to you and wanted case studies done. Why do you think uh, large companies struggle to produce case studies in house? I, I would assume they would have resources and yeah, capacity. I mean, the, the thing with case studies specifically is that it's a function that in most companies, no matter how big they are or how resourced up they are, no one fundamentally owns. Uh, we're seeing a shift in the market now with the emergence of more and more customer marketing and advocacy, advocacy roles and mm. people spearheading that. Um, but I think even in our, you know, our big enterprise size clients, it's not that they don't have writers. It's not that they don't have account execs. It's not that they don't have talented people. It's that customer stories in particular require this really critical mix of like white glove one to one treatment of that customer velocity, like the number one factor that determines whether your story will ever see the light of day is speed. And a lot of companies just aren't set up for speed, like their own creation teams get in their way. Um, you you really kind of need a specialized, streamlined, controlled process and well-defined ownership around it. And most companies just don't have that. You know, the number of calls we get on with companies who are doing 30 plus million to a, a billion or more in revenue. And the simple question is, do you have an SOP for how case studies get done? And the answer is just point blank, no, is alarming. But it's because it's always like, think of a product marketing manager. Case studies might get something thrown on their plate. It's not something they devote their entire time to. And because case studies are also a team sport, like the product marketing manager can't do them in isolation or a customer marketing manager or customer marketer, like they can't do it on their own. They're reliant on CSMs or sales to make the intro. They're reliant on, you know, maybe someone to do the actual creation and then someone to oversee the project. And so it's kind of nebulous, right? Like a lot of companies either just don't have the bandwidth, don't have the time, don't have the process or can't achieve the velocity. And that's where for us, you know, we're not hands at a keyboard. Hiring us is not like hiring a freelancer to write a piece. It's like we bring the bandwidth, the process, the white glove treatment, and the velocity. And I think that's why we've been successful in kind of getting in the door and, and working with these companies. And I think the advantage is it allows the great people who are in that business to not solely focus on that because really it's not at all uncommon for these assets to take a month or more. Once you consider going from interview to creation to the the most time consuming part is approvals, revisions and approvals. And if they can't focus on that, if they're torn in too many directions, then velocity dies, case studies die, company don't they don't achieve what they want. So I think it's it's a whole bunch of factors. And I think that's part of why we're set up the way we are today. We've moved from like we're a creative partner to we're a strategic and, and fulfillment partner. We can have yeah. both. How you explain that with kind of having somebody with ownership of the process internally, as well as like the team aspect, that makes a lot of sense to me. It reminds me of in the earlier days with conversion rate optimization or growth or experimentation. Now there's teams and it's really like this cross-functional pod that you need of like a designer, a developer, a copywriter, and then like a PM or project manager who kind of like organizes it all. And like an agency or a consultant would come in and help with that. And and now it's like something that, you know, companies understand. They they know that it can't just be like the solo operator who's expected to do all of this stuff. But it reminds me a lot of that uh, several years ago. Yeah, I, I say that's really accurate. And I think you know, that's the honest truth. Like, why was I able to do conversion work for really big companies? It's largely the same reasons, you know, they they needed someone to own it and drive it and bring a process to it and execute and coordinate the, the different pieces. It wasn't just, oh, I can write nice words. It was, it was everything that surrounded it. And I think with case studies, I think the unique challenge, especially for companies is just, if you can't get your teams internally aligned, and if you can't build an underlying process and system that supports the creation of these, right? 
How are you identifying candidates? How are you making the ask? Who's doing the, the ask making? How do you standardize that? How do you set the right expectation at that point of asking? How do you carry that through production? How do you handle approvals? How do you keep track of the assets once they're created? There, there's so many small problems that make up the big problem that I think it's still going to take some time for companies to really wrap their heads around how they enable it. And I think that's part of why for us, it was an important move to start now you know, leaning a little more into the strategic side and having discussions about that and trying to build that aspect of, of what we do out to move from just where we create stories to now trying to build ourselves to be in a place where we can have conversations about standing up SOPs or are you spiffing your sales team? All, all that stuff. That was all new territory and not stuff I ever anticipated we need to be involved in at the outset. And because of the market we serve and the problems we solve, now we do. So yeah, I think that's a really apt comparison. I think companies eventually over time will get more sophisticated with it, but I think there's just always this need for this consolidated, focused, you know, well done effort. Um, Cause a lot of little things have to go right. Where do you think companies are slipping up or dropping the ball in the process when they're trying to do case studies nowadays? It seems like there's a ton of work that goes into a case study before the words are ever printed on on a Google Doc, right? Yeah, yeah, or filmed in a video or whatever. I think you, just it's it's obvious. There's no process. There's an absence of documented, consolidated process. The biggest screw up is again. There's no central source of truth on. What is the process? Who owns the different parts of the process? What are our coverage gaps? Like something HubSpot is amazing at now is they document, okay, here's here's the coverage gaps. Here are the gaps we want to address with our stories for this quarter or for this year. And they mm -hmm. put that somewhere that everyone can see it so that everyone's on the same page, so that everyone from the people nominating and selecting stories to the people building question sets, to the people delivering the assets are all on the same page. That is rare in a company. It's rare. There's no ownership. There's no centralized source of truth. And so I think, you know, to put it in a sentence, companies look at these like an asset and not a program. You need a program. You need a process and systems to inform that program. But if you treat it like an asset, like let's just go do some case studies and you hope that great things come out the other side, you're in for a world of hurt. And that's still how most companies view it. It's like, well, let's task Mary in marketing with getting these customer stories done. And Mary goes, I don't have a first clue about how to get all these other teams mobilized, engaged. I don't even know how to identify clients to take part in these things. Like they treat it like it can be a solo effort. They delegate to one person when the need arises instead of, you know, what, what I believe, which is you can make case studies inevitable, but they're the outcome of an underlying system. Don't have that system. You're forever going to be chasing the ball. Qualitative wise, if you are looking at two different websites with a case study section on their website, two competitors, how do you know what a good case study is and what a bad case study is? Like, how do you judge a case study? When I'm evaluating, I, you know, I really look at, I mean, it starts with like, how are these things filtered? Um, you know, like, is it clear that they are prioritizing giving me as a prospective buyer? access to stories that will help influence my decision or are they treating this like a logo gallery hmm. um because if i come in and it's like look at all our biggest clients yeah that's gonna wow a certain contingent of your audience but it doesn't help them make de decisions like it's wonderful if you hire you know if, if shopify is your client and they chose you and they did this multi-million whatever that's great but if i don't have the same problems as shopify if i'm not looking for the same outcome as shopify if i'm not shopify sized that story is like decoration. It's like, wow, cool result doesn't help me decide at all. So part of what I look for is just how are these organized? How are they presented? How are they helping people kind of identify which stories make sense for the situation they're in? I think within the stories themselves, you know right away, at least I've learned to tell right away when a story was done without any customer input at all. Like mm -hmm. when you click in and it's like, we did bullet, 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 bullet. We achieved bullet, 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 bullet. There's no arc. There's no story. There's no customer voice in that. Like I want to see your customers front and center. I want to see a headshot. I want to see quotes. I want to see quotes throughout the piece. I want to hear them speaking to their challenge, not you outlining it as a third party. I want to hear them talking about their experience of not only your solution, but of the results made possible. 
So I'm looking for customer involvement. Like, was the customer interviewed? Is it clear they signed off on this? Is it clear that they were involved in, in the process of creating these? I think one of the things that I'm increasingly look for is, you know, looking for is do they cater to kind of different media or different interest levels? Do they have a summary section or are they bringing in aspects like videos or embedding audiograms so that if I want to hear that point spoken, I, I have the option to. I'm looking for the ways that they kind of integrate different media or visuals to help tell that story. Um, and then overall, I think just looking at, again, the, the storytelling, like, is there an arc I can follow? A list of things you did and nice quotes is not a success story. Um, it's not a customer story. It's just some metrics and some quotes from customers. So I want to see you know them walk me through as a prospect, like what happened? Why was it done this way? Why was it important? What came out of it? Um, in a way that allows me to go, okay, I get it. I can see the big picture. I can understand the context beyond the fancy bullets and the big metrics. So those are some of the different things that I look for. Um, and I think the worst stories out there are the ones that are it's just obvious. The company blasted this out in a vacuum, made it all about them and what they did, and completely forgot that, hey, there's a customer on the other side of this who probably could have made this much better. There was something interesting that you posted. I can't remember if it was on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, I, I found it insightful. It was like looking for value beyond the the results, or it, it was like we got a 10% conversion uplift or, or whatever it is like, but what, what did, what does that mean? Like, why is yeah. that important? What additional value does that have? What does that allow us to do now? Like this allowed us to achieve escape velocity in an incredibly competitive space with better funded competitors. And now we have optionality or, or what's that extra benefit. I, I found that fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for us, that's like the why behind the what it's like, what the metric is great, but what was the actual ROI? of that metric, right? Um, Classic example for us is like, it's one thing to say, you know, it made our frontline staff 60% more efficient. It's like, okay, well, that's a number. But what did that mean, right? And there's a story we wrote in that vein where we got a quote from the secretary said, I no longer have to go office to office hand delivering paychecks like a mail carrier or something like that. And for someone who's in that frontline role, who's currently going office to office delivering checks like a mail carrier, that that is more valuable to read than oh, efficiency up sixty percent. Like we want these hard boiled metrics, which like this amount of lift or this amount of traffic. But the real sexy, interesting story is like, what did that let you do, or stop doing, or make possible for you to do? So yeah, it's great. You know, taking an SEO example, it's like. Yeah, it's wonderful you increased organic traffic by 2000%. Now tell me what that meant for the company. Like, were they able to avoid hiring more headcount? Were they able to reallocate funds into other campaigns that led to even more benefits? Were they able to go from underdog to, you know, industry leader? Like, tell me why that metric even mattered. And I think that gets missed a lot. You know, we love the question, like, what did that mean for you? What did that make possible for you? What did that make possible for your boss? What did that mean for your team? What has that meant for your company? What can you do now or do better that you couldn't do before? Those are always we phrase that question that go, yeah, okay, the metrics, wonderful. We've, we've ticked that box. We know it's important for getting eyeballs on the piece. But when we want to sell someone, they're not going to get you know, excited about just the metric, they want to know, well, what would that look like for me? What actual pain that I'm experiencing, you know, would that solve? Because very few people are going to go, oh, you know, I'm really just feeling like frontline staff should be 60% more efficient. They're going to go, man, I really wish we didn't have to handle liver checks anymore. So I'm not a copywriter by trade, but doesn't that, isn't there a framework of sorts when you go through to punch up copy and you, you basically go line by line and ask, so what? Yeah. Try to answer that question at all points. Yeah. It's, I mean, that can be used in a lot of ways. Like why does this line even need to be here? Or why does this feature benefit? Like, why does it actually matter? Like, okay, it exists, but it's not valuable by virtue of existing. Like what does it actually, yeah. What does it actually enable or empower or 
or accomplish. So there's parallels there too, right? I think that's one of the benefits for me coming out of the conversion side of things is now, you know, it's something I think we can always be getting better at, but something that I think my team is is pretty darn good at is looking for the things that will drive a decision versus driving well, you read the whole thing or you, you clicked in. And we know for sure not everyone's going to read these things from start to finish, but for the ones that do, we want to take them on a journey that feels like, yeah, I want this, I get this. Um, because you could be a great copywriter and write a wonderful landing page, but you know, a case study is there's nothing better than that, for example, to bring an obscure use case to life, let's say. Here's how they actually put it to work and what it looked like in practice and all of that. So I think, you know, we try to bring those where we can conversion elements into what we do. And it's something I think there's room for us to do better with. But I think that's that's an important consideration. Like the number of case studies I see out in the wall that have no call to action at all. Like you just finished telling somebody a story that they should aspire to and you're not going to push them anywhere. Like, yeah, it feels feels like a loss. I just think it's cool that like your background experiences end up interwoven into your current day work. Like, I don't know how much you had to do sort of an identity shift from, from copywriter to business owner, or, you know, I don't know if your tribe has changed to like product marketing versus like the conversion optimization department, but you're clearly still pulling lessons from conversion, copywriting, and also that process orientation. Right. And like, I had to sort of strip my identity in the experimentation space to focus on the agency. But the way we do content invokes principles from experimentation and conversion optimization, which ends up differentiating you service-wise. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's you know, to go all the way back to the question from the beginning. I think that's like another point of like mindset shift or mourning. Like when you've spent so much time in an industry building yourself up to be seen as one thing or knowledgeable in one area, it can be tough to let go of. Um you know, a lot of my community is still copywriters, but if I want to grow a case study, but yet, you know, I need to be in more customer marketing communities, not more customer marketing events and product marketing. And, you know, that, that has been, I think, a more um, recent intentional sort of thing for, for me is to try to diversify or just get in, in front of a different group of people and start learning from them and asking questions of them and, and being invested in them. And, you know, there's that part of me that's been resistant to that. Um, it's like, well, what if the market forgets I can do conversion stuff? And yep. you know, what what if I become irrelevant there? And and that's been hard, you know, to take all these great leads that I, I would still get on the conversion side and, and pass them all on. But I think, you know, again, trying to have the mindset shift of it always comes back around. Um, if I if I go back that direction, I did it once, I could do it again. And planting seeds for the future, and even if I never go back, you know, I I'm taking what I learned with me, and then I'm also creating opportunities for other people, and, and I can feel good about that. <laughs> it's funny, yeah, I, I really resonate with that. I, I it's it's like a loss aversion type thing, or it might be tied to the ego, but it's almost hard to admit um, that I felt those same fears around leaving be, uh, behind experimentation. And um, on kind of a funny note, it's like you know, like you get known for something. You were talking before about like wanting to you know, look like the smart person. And uh, when I wrote for CXL, it was, it was beautiful because I was really young in my career and I could write these articles and like PEP standards were really high. So they were good articles and they were about like technical subjects. And uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine uh, worked at a company and said that an article of mine was shared in their company Slack. And I was like, all right. <laughs> you know? And it's like that, that ego component wants to stay there and continue to be known as like a smart experimentation guy. But I know at some practical level that that's not helping me, at least to the degree that it could be in my business building, in my life right now. It's That's yeah. the, the old days. And it's like trying to hold on to some, some semblance of that. Yeah. I mean, I forget who made me aware of it. Um, but it's a good, I don't know, visual or analogy. Like, what do we do? When we are afraid, when when we feel fear, we grab onto something. Whether you're in a car, you grab the wheel tightly. If you're in a haunted house and, and you're with someone and something scares you, you grab onto them. Or you, when you're scared, you grab onto things. Um, I think it was I think it was my, my business coach actually, and I found that to be true. You know, like part of my holding on to that conversion or copywriter title or holding on to 
the accomplishments I'd had there or the things I'd done or all of that. It's just fear. It's, it's fear that if I let go, what happens? What if it goes away? But eventually, you know, if you're dragging that along, it's it's not serving you either. It's it's holding you back. It's slowing you down. Um, and I think part of getting past that is asking yourself, like, what what is it I'm afraid of here? What is it that I'm afraid will happen? How likely is it? And what's the worst thing that could happen if it if it does? And I think for me, you know, I still get leads on the conversion copy side, and I haven't been doing that stuff formally for over two years. So it, slow to go away and i think recognizing too like it's it's not just that people you know grew to appreciate me for the the conversion side of it it's there's other things that i do or bring or offer or whatever that that people value too it's not just what i do you know it's cheesy to say but a lot of it's like who who you are who i am um and and that's a learning that again yeah how how do you get past the fear of letting go of that previous role or title or community or whatever. And I think for me, at least I found like, well, it doesn't, it doesn't really go away. And once I stopped worrying about it, I was able to really press into new and exciting things. And, you know, I, I feel like I've successfully made the transition in some ways from conversion copy SAS guy to case study guy. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that. So yeah, you can always go back, but so that's one more, you know, mindset thing that's difficult as you grow or move on or try new things. That's awesome. We, we, we've been saying this phrase called faith, not fear, um, because we don't want to be making decisions from a place of fear and let fear hold us back. Right. And also to acknowledge that when you feel that fear, it often means you're moving towards something that matters. So it's like, it's a good signal that you're heading in some sort of a right direction because it makes you feel that discomfort. So it's like acknowledging the fear and then having faith anyway. Like that's been a common refrain with, with me and my co-founders. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's easy to get lost in the tangle too. Cause I think, you know, the things that are scary now, you know, they feel big. Every, everything feels big when you're facing it, but you know, looking back, it's like, well, the worries I had as a freelancer actually weren't that big. And I'm sure one day I'll look back and go, you know, the worries I had at this stage weren't actually that big. Everything feels really big in the moment. And I think, like you say, it's it's that whole like do it anyway kind of mentality where it's like if if you're not doing things that are a little bit uncomfortable, are you growing? Are you evolving? Are you, you know, are you moving at all? Um, and so learning to recognize, yeah, recognize that fear is like, well, I might be on the cusp of something or I might be. I might be growing, you know, that can be a way of reframing it too. So this may or may not be a good transition, but you were talking before about AI tools and yeah. potentially some fear. I don't know about fear, if that's the right word on that, but like we had talked uh, before we started recording, I think on the, uh, the macro economy, the macro trends of AI. Um, uh, how do you feel about that with regards to case study, buddy? I obviously I've, I've, you know, lost a little sleep uh, running a content agency, but I, I've got my own thoughts at this point. Yeah. I think what's been interesting for me is the myriad responses to it. I think a few years ago, I would have found myself in the camp of like, bury your head, pretend it's not a big deal, you know, like, can't hurt you if you don't look at it. Kind of thing. And this time, I look at it with excitement. Um, I don't want to, you know, I'm not old, but I'm 35. I don't want to be behind the eight ball and and move into irrelevance because I'm afraid of my job changing or I'm afraid of the market changing or I'm afraid of new tools or new ideas. And so for me, I've really, you know, I've encouraged my team. Like, you know, how can we play with this? How could this make us better? Let's push it. Let's find the limits. Let's see what what it can help us do, what can it replace? And let's be honest about that, you know, brutally honest. If 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 it can do a job well, like, do we have a good case for not letting it? And so I think, especially in like copy and content and, and marketing as a whole, I think people are still in, in one of two camps. They're either like looking at through the lens of like um, the over ideal or like, the apocalyptic. And I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. I do think this yep. is 
the most seismic shift in everything since the iPhone or, or since you know, I, I do see it as a landmark moment in history that is going to impact a lot. And I would rather embrace that moment with excitement and curiosity than be terrified of it because we're all, I mean, it's easy to forget, but we're all figuring it out in lockstep. Like the vast majority of us are all figuring out together where this thing is going to go and, and what the constraints will be and how it will impact us. And I mean, specific to case study, buddy, you know, where I see the most potential is on the side of repurposing, on the side of condensing or categorizing, you know, there's things I, I'm dying to, to see this be able to do. Uh, if we can feed case studies in and it can spit out, you know, categories that fit within the sales, you know, conversations our clients are having, like that's an amazing thing to not have to do manually. Really. If we can use it to iterate on headlines or different ways of saying things, that's great. Or if we can use it, if, if we can create the core story using the process we already do and then have it transform that into a largely workable one sheet, or if we can have it pull quotes out and then, you know, again, categorize them or even, hey, we, you know, it, it takes the pull quotes we've identified, pushes them into can, you know, Canva against the template we've already defined for the client. And now our designer can go in and just do cleanup. Like, I think there's, there's tons of potential. And then at the same time, I also remind myself, like the human element, especially in storytelling is so important. The voice you do it with the consideration you bring to that story, the constraints you place on it. Um, so I'm not worried about being replaced. I'm, I'm excited about being accelerated. Mm, that's a healthy mindset. Yeah. I mean, I think if you're leaning on these tools in a way that is going to replace your maybe competitive advantage, that's probably not an ideal way to look at these. Because if everybody else has access to those, uh, you know, your competitive moat isn't really a moat, but it's like, these are going to be great for doing things that aren't a moat. So like for us repurposing, like if we have the ideas, if we have the the content, repurposing it is really like this manual kind of tedious process. And if we can like repurpose that into a LinkedIn post, that just furthers the distribution we have. Now, because all of those things, the barrier to entry is lower, now we have more time to focus on the emergently valuable properties of content, which is like ideas, expertise, differentiation, strategy, like all of those things. And we lean more into those and and hopefully become more valuable because of that. Um, I would be worried if I was, yeah, maybe producing like, like super commoditized, you know, like content mill stuff. Like, I think that yeah. would that'd be a scary place to be. I would, I would be a little nervous then. For sure. I mean, it's, Again, we can't bury our heads in the sand and say it's not, you know, my mentality has been it doesn't have to take your job to change it. Um, I mean, look at all the people and my my heart goes up to like look at the people who made a living on Fiverr, especially overseas, doing you know, cartoon portraits or mm. um, you know, a unique style of headshot or whatever. I mean, there's still room for unique art styles and, and custom work within that. Um, but you look at what mid journey is doing or what some of these platforms are doing and, and the barrier to entry to that came way down. And so did the cost. And so you know, that's, it's a legitimate little corner of design that I you know, I think will face some, some really tough times. Um, you know, product copy, uh, location-based landing pages, like, all these things are kind of rife for anything that's programmatic and done in like a gargantuan scale, like where quality is not the major consideration. Like, yeah, you do have cause to be concerned. You know, I, I think we're already seeing some interesting changes with things like, you know, uh, fingerprint being added that, you know, can kind of detect, well, hey, I put this together, or whatever, like tech is going to counter tech. But yeah, I, you know, it's, it's not that, it's not that there's no value in those things, but it depends on it, like what the expectation is. And like, that's too, you know, you even use the headshot thing and it's like, okay, but then there's this gal who does called ugly portraits and they're like these incredible, like hand painted art style. You know, it's very distinctive. It's, it's all her and spoke to the people. And like, you know, I, I don't think she's going to have any issue. I think she'll be all right. She's really, built a brand and an identity and a process that can live outside of it. So 
it, it comes down to who you serve, especially what their expectations are. And do you have to move up market or move into a different area? But it's going to be fascinating to see what comes out of it. Yeah, it's an exciting time. Uh, I think change change is going to happen. And it's like uh, not burying your head in the sand, leaning in a little bit. Um, all right. So we're coming up on time, Joel. Uh, if there is anything else we didn't talk about, speak now or forever hold your peace. Do you have anything else? <laughs> no, I think, I think it's been good. I think if anything, I don't know, I'm far from that Zen-like state of having it all figured out and just knowing. But I think if there's something that I wish someone would have told me earlier on or that I would have been able to wrap my head around. It's the ideas of like, it doesn't have to be perfect to be good and learn to ask for help. I think those two things would have carried me so much further, so much faster. Um, in business, you know, it's, it's not a lone wolf's game. Um, increasingly I learn it's not about how smart you are. It's about how, how well you can, take advice or seek out help or, you know, motivate and engage other people. So yeah, I, that would be the note I'd probably leave it on is whether it's mindset or whether it's just as you look to the future of all this stuff, like those would be two things to keep in mind. I wish I would have heard those earlier in my career as well. So that's a great note to end on. Um, where can people find you online? Yeah. Uh, at Joel Kletke on Twitter. Um, and then on LinkedIn, just Joel Kletke. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one in the world that don't always respond quickly, um, but I do always respond. Um, you can check out things that we're publishing and, and sharing on casestudybuddy.com. And then if you want to dig into conversion side, I've got a bit of a history on businesscasualcopywriting.com and there's some basic sales trainings and, and things like there that might help you kind of level up if you're if you're early on in your, your journey. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Cheers.